We're going to start with Jamie Rogers, who um, holds a PhD and an MA from the Shakespeare Institute in Birmingham. You were originally trained at Lambda. And then before you did your PhD, you worked for 10 <laughs> years in broadcasting, which yes. is very impressive. Um, but most recently, you've been working on the Multicultural Shakespeare Project at Warwick. Um, and you have been in charge of this very exciting performance database, the British Black and Asian Shakespeare database. And that's, I have a very strong feeling, is part of what you're going to be talking about today. So your title is, um, This Great Role Has Been Diminished, Critics, Race and Shakespearean Theatre. So a warm welcome to you, Jamie. So, somewhat counterintuitively, I want to begin with Benedict Cumberbatch. Benedict Cumberbatch photobombing you two at the Oscars. Benedict Cumberbatch at the Arsenal celebration of its FA Cup win. He's reportedly a Chelsea fan, by the way. Benedict Cumberbatch at the Chelsea Flower Show. Benedict Cumberbatch at the F1 races. Benedict Cumberbatch reading the D-Day news broadcast on, yes, the 70th anniversary of D-Day. In short, Benedict, Cumber Benedict Cumberbatch, try saying that seven times, um, is everywhere, including his Hamlet recently. This hasn't happened by accident. Benedict Cumberbatch clearly has the hardest working publicist in the business because she gets him into the most ludicrously disparate events and even gets him onto the Today program to read the news, albeit the news from 70 years ago. She's feeding the media beast, and the media beast is lapping up Benedict Cumberbatch, fueling his stardom and marketing potential, not to mention his casting potential exponentially. Just to reiterate the point... None of this has happened by accident, nor does it happen by accident for any actor, director, theater company, television show, or any other aspect of the entertainment industry. The media, broadcast and print, has a history of racism. Countless studies have been done, and although, like many aspe aspects of society, it has been a lot better in recent years, particularly after the murder of Stephen Lawrence, where news organizations were instrumental in keeping the case in the public eye, and thus finally resulting in convictions 20 years after Lawrence was killed at a bus stop in April 1993. There has been a lot of media attention of late around the issue of integrated casting in Britain, and there's a bit of a one-note strand to it currently. The theme has been that Britain is losing a generation of actors to Hollywood because of the racism within the indus entertainment industry. And we don't see David Harrowood or Adrian Lester or Sophie Alcanido or Josette Simon photobombing you too or at the Arsenal FA Cup party or reading a 70-year-old news bulletin on an important anniversary date. We see David Harrowood, the National Theatre's first black Othello, quote-unquote, mouthing off about racism in the entertainment industry. We see David Oyelowo, the Royal Shakespeare Company's first black English king, quote-unquote, complaining he's had to move to California because the work's dried up here. Oh, boo-hoo, he's got sunshine all the time in one potential subtext to that hard luck story. Hard luck story, in quotation marks. In a comment piece written for The Guardian, Harrowood relates that his remarks at the BAFTAs caused a backlash that he had not expected. Um, I certainly didn't think my comments were as inflammatory as reported in the press the following day. Harrowood accuses TV bosses of racism, ran one headline, while others used words like Harrowood blasts and Harrowood attacks as if I were an angry King Lear raging against the unjust gods of television. The thing is, the media sometimes changes the story, often in terms of race and the entertainment industry, in ways that is inten it's intended to change the conversation. So, going back to Benedict Cumberbatch, weirdly, talking on the Tavis Smiley show on PBS, and just for some context, Tavis Smiley is an African-American television presenter on, on the public broadcasting network. Cumberbatch said, quote, I think as far as colored actors go, it gets really different in the UK. And a lot of my friends have had more opportunities here in America than in the UK. And that's something that needs to change, unquote. 
it's not good to use an outdated term that uses the language of created oppression, but the content of the news coverage in this country did not focus on his point. It focused on the gaffe and brushed the issue he was trying to raise under the carpet. Uh, as Lanry Bakari and The Guardian wrote in, a, in an op-ed piece, Benedict Cumberbatch had a brain fart. A brain fart that's grown into a mushroom cloud of offense, conjecture, and outrage. His crime? Saying the word colored when referring to black actors during an interview in which, funnily enough, he talked about the trouble non-white British actors have breaking through in the UK. What's fascinating about this to me is that this this gaffe was not picked up in the U.S. media in the same way it hit the headlines here. I know this because I woke up in the morning and saw the headlines and immediately emailed the states because he was promoting a television program I used to work for. So I was like, hey guys, did you see this? And they were like, no, because it wasn't running in the U.S. Um, so... Much more troubling, in a way, was how the media covered, or didn't cover, Idris Elba's speech on diversity in Parliament back in January. Basically, didn't cover it, really. The speech's content made the news that night, but by morning, all hell had broken loose. Now, I want to, I want to read just a, an excerpt of, of his speech. And he, so, this is, this is Idris Elba. It was an hour, basically, in Parliament, talking about diversity. It was a great speech. I recommend looking it up. Um, but he says, so I got to a certain point in my career, and I saw that glass ceiling. I was very close to hitting my forehead on it. I was busy. I was getting lots of work. But I realized I could only play so many best friends and, or gang leaders. I knew I wasn't going to land a lead role. I knew there wasn't enough imagination in the industry for me to be seen as a lead. In other words, if I wanted to star in a British drama, drama like Luther, then I'd have to go to a country like America. Now, some people might say, but back then, Britain hardly had any black detectives, so how could you expect us to have a TV show about one? How could you expect the BBC to have the imagination to put Luther on TV? Because it's television. And the other thing was, because I never saw myself or my culture on TV, I stopped watching TV. Instead, I decided to go out and become TV. If I aspired to be on a level with the Denzel Washingtons and the Robert De Niro's, I had to reinvent myself. I had to transform the way the industry saw me. I had to climb out of the box. In other words, I, had to go, I, I didn't go to America because I couldn't get parts. I went to America because I was running out of parts. They were all the same sort of parts. So that's a little of what he was saying. So he makes this speech, and the media changed the narrative in the morning because the Oscar boycott sucked all the oxygen out of Idris Elba's speech. Nobody paid attention to the issues he was raising because they were t busy changing, changing the media narrative to talk about America and the American problem with the Oscars. So what I'm starting to question in my work is how what academics refer to as reception has influenced the issue of the glass ceiling and Shakespearean casting for ethnic minority actors. Or to put it more bluntly, I'm beginning to question the role the media has played in maintaining a form of the old status quo, that keeping black East Asian and South Asian performers out of the top jobs on the classical stage, keeping them from being the Benedict Cumberbatches of their generation, so this paper is intended to explore some of the ways that other factors may influence casting decisions, and one driving force is the media. So let's pretend it's 1990. And for, for the first time in its history, the Royal Shakespeare Company casts a black actor, Clarence Smith, who's currently playing Claudius in, in, in Hamlet uh, in Stratford at the moment, to play the King of France in King Lear, and another black actor, Patterson Joseph, to play Oswald in King Lear. Charles Osborne's reaction in the Daily Telegraph, quote, as too often with the Royal Shakespeare Company, there are several elements in this staging to make the willing suspension of disbelief as difficult to achieve as possible. Among others, there is a black king of France. Yes, I know the audience isn't supposed to notice. 
Osborne then goes on to complain about a woman being cast as the fool, which was his major bone of contention, and not, as I would have done, mention the fact that she was barely intelligible. Um, the male on Sunday's Kenneth Hearn also registered his annoyance at the integrated casting in Nicholas Heitner's production of King Lear under the premise of railing against director's theater. May I distress you further? He rhetorically asks his readers. Of course. Um, quote, Lear fires a rifle across his dinner table. He also has a wheelchair. A few black characters fashionably intrude. Patterson Joseph, by the way, won second prize in the 1991 Ian Charleston Awards given for the best classical performance by an actor under the age of 30, in part for his performance as Oswald, one of the fashionably intruding black characters in that 1990 King Lear. So in Patterson Joseph circa 1991, what we have is a seeming dichotomy between what the press implies about him, that he and, and Clarence Smith and others don't belong on a classical stage because of the color of their skin, and what the industry thinks of him. The talent is recognized in the Ian Charlson Award, and factions of the press are opposed to integrated casting. So as far as the media goes, it's been a steady drip, drip, drip against integrated casting for decades. The tactics have changed from outright racism to couching it in terms of a debate. debate. But in order to illustrate how this has shifted, I want to draw your attention to Othello. And as I'm sure you're all aware, this play has been at the epicenter of debates about who should be able to play Shakespeare's great tragic role or roles. We don't have to go back too far um, to see when the debate really started to become very politicized. 1979, and the BBC series, the BBC Shakespeare series, attempted to hire the African-American actor James Earl Jones to play Othello. There followed a two-year-long protracted, protracted battle with British Actors' Equity, whose position was, quite rightly, that homegrown British talent should play this role. They lost and forever preserved on videotape is Sir Anthony Hopkins. Sorry, Sir Ant Anthony. The only saving grace is that at least videotape isn't as glamorous as being preserved on celluloid. As far as we can see from the British Black and Asian Shakespeare Performance Database entry for Othello, this debate really took off in performance terms in the 1980s. Arguably, one of the most important of these productions was, that, was the one that garnered the most media attention in the mid-1980s, David Thacker's 1984 production of the young, at the Young Vic with Rudolph Walker as Othello. Thacker's reasoning, he told me in an interview for the Multicultural Shakespeare Project, which you can listen to on the British Black and Asian Shakespeare Performance Database, um, was that he, quote, found it would have been insulting to all black actors, politically completely unacceptable, and artistically stupid, ridiculous actually, worthy of ridicule, ridicule to have cast a white actor as Othello. What's difficult to believe now is the fact that Rudolph Walker was only the fourth black actor to have, played, to have ever played Othello in London. Ira Aldridge, Paul Robeson in 1930, Errol John at the, uh, at the Old Vic in 1963. And Errol John, in fact, was not the man originally cast to play Othello because the white actor originally cast had died of a heart attack a few months before rehearsals began. Um, and then the fourth actor was Rudolph Walker. So the press viewed this as a political act on Thacker's part. And this is where the relationship between the media and the arts gets tricky. The press release began with the headline, First Black, a fellow on London stage for over 20 years, and then delved into the list I've just given you. Needless to say, there was kickback in the press, who were, after all, far more used to white actors blacking up, and who had recently seen Paul Schofield in 1980 do so for the National, and the year before that, Donald Sinden had blacked up at the RSC. And in fact, the previous Othello at the Young Vic in 1982 was Kenneth Haig, another white actor. I'm not entirely sure he did black up entirely. The photos are a little murky. Um, Anyway, the Sunday Times, for example, ran a feature about the production using the publicity angle provided to them by the Young Vic. 
Seemingly, the piece was simply providing facts to its readers by noting that only, quote, only two black actors have played Othello on the London stage this century, with the young Vic currently rehearsing a third. However, the underlying racial hostility permeated even this otherwise innocuous piece as the author had to insert the phrase, as unlikely as it may seem that this was, ha- that this was only the third black actor in the century. Really? And when had the author seen a black actor play Othello as a matter of course? Or did he think those were Donald Sindon's and Laurence Olivier's actual complexions under all black makeup? Please. Um, some reviews almost seemed to revel in perpetuating the stereotype of the angry black man as well. Some more subtly than others. In the Financial Times, Martin Hoyle noted that Rudolph Walker, quote, really froths in his rage, unquote, a phrase that was positively tame by comparison to, the, what, what, to that written by Keith Nurse. In a Daily Telegraph, Nurse picked up the theme and embellished it in his first paragraph, beginning his review with Iago's dark and malevolent purpose clearly takes on a deeper racial meaning when the moor is seen to fall into a genuine black rage, unquote. The verb froth and the adjective genuine in these reviews are indicative of preconceived notions that pervaded media coverage of race at the time, at the time that Thacker's production debuted. The stereotype of the angry black man is embedded in both descriptions and reflective of what Barry Troina found to be a focus on the trouble incidents, which included the race riots and crime linked to the black population, leading to unfavorable views of ethnic minorities. While the Brixton riots still reverberating, with the Brixton, Brixton riots still reverberating and the prevalent association between the black population and the violent crime rate, these Othello reviewers fed the stereotypes in what reads as hostility to the performer with reference to his race. I'm sure they disagree. So I'm probably rapidly running out of time, so I want to sort of fast forward through some other examples pertaining to Othello. So one, in 1993, Bill Alexander cast Jeffrey Kassoon as Othello at the Birmingham Rep. And in terms of contextualizing that within its time, it's also worth noting that the production closed 10, closed 10 days before Stephen Lawrence was murdered. That was long before the country began a national, me- mediatized conversation about race. The production also occurred a good decade before New Labour promoted Britishness rather than Englishness, which by, shifting, by, with, which by a shifting of language emphasized the presence of the other in the United Kingdom, something you can, would prefer not to acknowledge. So, and Bill Alexander's Othello also occurred um, before the Royal Shakespeare Company or the National Theatre had cast a black actor to play Othello, a stressed black actor, as Willard White is an opera singer. So, given the climate, it's noteworthy that with Othello, you can detect the rep's press department working to justify the decision to cast a black Othello, including a comment attributed to Bill Alexander when the production was announced. The Birmingham Post reported that Jeffrey Kassoon, quote, was described by Bill Alexander as the actor he believed was best equipped to play the role. It's a running theme in some of these things you see in the press. And... You know, I go, best equipped to play the role? Of course, Bill Alexander was not going to cast someone he didn't think was up to the job. But this sort of comment was, was and is almost standard as a way of diffusing what was still, at, back then, a controversial, controversial casting decision. Fast forward a few more years. In 1999, Ray Fearon played a fellow at the Royal Shakespeare Company, the first black actor to have played the part there since Paul Robeson in 1959, because Willard White was an opera singer. Um, the production got glowing reviews overall, but embedded in some of them were backhanded compliments. Benedict Nightingale, for example, wrote in The Times, Quote, Fearon's lack of years seemed to explain why, why Othello's authority was somewhat lacking, too. His verse speaking sounded over-deliberate, and his earnestness almost reduced the great boastful speech about his winning Desdemona to an anthropological lecture in a failing university. Fearon is not the most profound of Othello's, but thanks to Waite's unaffected warmth, he is one of the most touching. 
So without the white actress, Fearon's performance would not have been touching. Um, in fact, Ray Fearon's youth was the most frequently cited complaint against the performance, as weirdly had been the case two years previously when David Harewood had played the part for Sam Mendes at the National. So, now we come to my favorite article I've found recently. In 2004, Alastair McCauley wrote a piece in the Financial Times that was clearly a repudiation of some of the Othellos he'd seen recently. Um, it was just jaw-droppingly offensive, couched in the terms of that debate that seems to have been where it's been shifting. Basically, that it was time, his argument was, that white actors were allowed to play Othello. And some of his case is set out thus. Of course, many white actors have failed as Othello, and if I get my way, if I get my way... Doubtless, I'll have to see a good many not good enough white actors play the role. But then, that's just what I've been seeing. Othello played by not quite good enough actors. I mean, this goes back to what Bill Alexander, the, the, press, the press quote Bill Alexander had to give in 93. This is 2004. Um, Actors with limited Shakespearean experience have been pole vaulted into the role because A, they're black, they're, they're A, black, and B, hunky. Now, both Harrowwood, Harrowwood had played Othello before, he'd played Romeo before, Ray Fearon had an amazing track record with Royal Shakespeare Company before he played Othello. So to say that um, they, both of them were pole vaulted into it is ludicrous. Um, some of them are fine actors in other roles, ouch, and have done honor to certain aspects of the part. But Othello, more than most, calls for classical acting maturity and authority. Neither Sam David Harrowwood nor Ray Fearon convinced me that they were great actors. Merely, I'm afraid, the most suitable black actors then available. And this one, I think, as offensive as that is, I think this... this is even more dangerous. It's the same piece. Theater goers now live in an age of colorblind casting. Hooray! You can just sense the sarcasm. I've seen black actors play Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, Henry V, Henry VI, Brutus, Antony Troilus, Titania, Rosalind, Juliet, Cressida, Isabella, Kate, the Shrew, and that's not counting all, all black productions. By the time David Ayelowo so movingly played Henry VI at the RSC in 2000 and Adrian Lester ingeniously reconceived the title role of Henry V at the National in 2003, the color barrier had been well and truly dissolved. What, why can we not have colorblind casting in Othello too? Oh, for God's sake. Um, it is dangerous because somewhere around the millennium, progress stopped being made in terms of performers of color. I mean, I'm just looking, you know, Hamlet, at the time there had been six ethnic minority actors who played Hamlet. Papa Asayadu was the seventh. I don't know where he saw. Oh, oh he's talking about Adrian Lester. That's it. I mean, it, it, uh, um, this is like editorial comments. <laughs> you know, Timo's relaxed version. of. <laughs> um, so there is... There is, there is still the volume, as the British Black and Asian Shakespeare Performance Database shows, there's still the volume, the, but, but the mechanism got stuck. And ethnic minorities were not being given the opportunities that they had had when Patterson Joseph first came to the RSC, for instance. In fact, you look at the, the, their Shakespearean careers on the database, and both Patterson Joseph and Ray Fearon had nearly a decade between having played Othello and Oberon in 2002 and 2003, respectively, um, in Manchester and Sheffield, and then between that, that, those two roles they played, and then playing Brutus and Mark Antony for the Royal Shakespeare Company and Greg Doran's production in 2012. Josette Simon, on the female side, and by the, you know, by the way, the, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about black actors um, because 
that's the, 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 that's the largest ethnic minority in the database. Um, and East Asians and South Asians have not made, actors have not made, made it up to, to this level in large quantities. Um, so Josette Simon was given a breakthrough lead as Isabella in Measure for Measure at the RSC in 1987. And since that production by Nicholas Heitner, there has not been a single ethnic minority actress to have played that part on a major stage. So the National, the RSC, and the Globe. And this discounts anything that they might do in tour, schools touring, because those are far more diverse castings. Um, and in fact, Josette Simon has not, had, have, has not played a major Shakespearean role since 1999. Now, with this, you have to factor in career choices, but I, you know, such as television, making money. But I don't think it's a coincidence that the press became ambivalent, or in some cases, downright hostile to ethnic minorities in classical theater, and also, at the same time, created an impression that it was common to see black or Asian actors playing leads. It's not common, or at least it's only a common occurrence in the comedies, but not the histories and the tragedies. It's also interesting that, it to, in, that in 2000, this impression was also being expressed by those who had come before, so to speak. Another example of this theory about why the interest in ethnic minorities cast in Shakespeare is narrowed may be found within some of the comments in the press at the time of the announcement in September 2000 that David Oyelowo would be the, ne the RSC's next Henry VI. It was an overwhelming impression in some quarters that the decision was blasé and not newsworthy. Writing for The Guardian, Hugh Quarshi, who had been the recipient of a fair amount of media attention himself, in part thanks to the RSC press office back in the 1980s, um, pitching um, his castings, noted, quote, the RSC has been here before and it really is no big deal. Jeremy Kingston in The Times also observed that all the major companies have been casting black actors for donkey's years, not just in the peripheral roles of servants and apothecaries, but in many of Shakespeare's leading roles, unquote. There have also been several comments in the media that integrated casting has been standard in the theater for a number of years, as recently as 2012. So if complacency in the media had not developed, that this is now a non-story because it always happens and it's been happening for donkey's years as Jeremy Kingston tries to attest and if theater companies were able to pitch stories that would be accepted about up and coming ethnic minority actors would there be more black hamlets or if David Harewood or David Ayelowo or Adrian Lester had Benedict Cumberbatch's publicist would they have been playing Hamlet at the Barbican in 2015? I don't know. But what I do know is that since Danny Lee Winter founded Act for Change, and I am now on the committee for Act for Change, there has been immense media coverage of diversity issues, some of which I've mentioned before, not all of it exactly with the positive spin or even bothering to come, you know, bothering to cover it. Without this massive two-year-long scrutiny, I doubt very seriously that in 2016 we would have Papa Asayadu, Don Warrington, or Ray Fearon playing the leading tragic roles of Hamlet, King Lear, and Macbeth, or indeed even Michelle Terry playing Henry V this summer. Whether this is sustainable, or indeed when whether East Asian and South Asian actors will be able to break through into the top tier of classical tra tragic roles is open for debate. But I think it's dependent on keeping the Alistair Macaulay's of the world marginalized and not in print. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who has thought that this is a particularly important paper in this building, um, because to quote Timo, beyond the threshold of that, of that door is the theatre, and in that theatre, um, Trevor Nunn's production of The Wars of the Roses played last year to full houses, I think, with an apparently deliberately all-white cast. 
I don't know if the um, if the cast has been announced for King John. It's much yet. more diverse. It hasn't is been it announced, but it is much more diverse. Yeah. yeah, and I found it very interesting in the fact that you know there was some media coverage of this event, but which seemed to die out rather quickly and didn't yeah. actually have any. So that sort of you know just brings me to a kind of a question that I've been wanting to ask <laughs> you ever since I heard you talk about this the first time, which we can get back to. But again, and you've partly answered it today, how do we get to the problem? How do we get from creating a database to tackling the problem of directors, audiences, theatre directors, um, and the people who have you know, the, the, the financial mm. decision-making power in this industry? So I think, I think that... That's really, really important to get on to later, I hope. 